Hello and welcome to another episode of Supercoach Insider. My name is Chris and we're back for season 2024, guys. Get excited, get around it. Um, I've uh, been knee deep in Supercoach stuff all week. It's um, It's been a long off season, but very happy to, to get back into it. Uh, before we get started, though, I do want to go through and thank Swizz, uh, has been, who has been carrying our channel across the off season uh, with his BBL content and obviously also his um nbl content i think he did like one or two of those as well so um thanks to swizz um i am not interested in bbl at all um so <laughs> that was a good thing for for him to jump on board with us um but yeah we're back into the season i know swizz dropped his um team yesterday and and yeah, you know, me and the boys and um and a few of the other groups that i'm in have been chatting a little bit so this isn't necessarily my sort of uh, first team, like when I opened the app on, I think it was uh, the 21st of December, I want to say, um, so much. It's, it's you know, what it is looking like now. Um, and then, you know, as the preseason progresses, this series will be an update of the, the current team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so without further ado, I will get into the team. Um, I'm going with a little bit of different strategy um, at the moment, um, mainly because of, uh, you know, buys and, um, and things like that that do impact the season at the start. We don't know really, it's, it's hard to quantify how much best 18 and the early buys and you know, teams having one more buy technically than others is going to have an overall impact. This is, this is kind of a unique year. I'm taking the approach of, look, risk it for the biscuit and try to navigate it the best you possibly can to get the edge. Because ultimately, if, if you guys do follow me and follow the stuff that I do, the, the moves that I make sometimes backfire and it's because I try to win so I make moves to try and win that end up not necessarily being the best overall moves unfortunately so when I when I do my teams and, and what I'm trying to do I'm trying to get a little bit of an edge here or there maybe one or two percent or five percent here will give me a long-term edge and hopefully get lucky with injuries and, and then I don't you know burn on trades which is what I've done for pretty much the last three years but I'm okay with it um I, I play hard, I play fast, and if I burn out, then so be it. But one year, it's going to happen where that's going to all click and you know, by round 18, I'm out of trades, but I managed to survive to the end. That's the goal. So one day, I'll get there. Anyway, now, uh, let's get into the team. So I, I suppose the first things first, first cap off the rank, um, I until last week, I had Dacos penciled in, absolutely guaranteed, can't get me off him. Um, and then I really started to look at the fixtures and it's not great. So in the first five games, obviously, I think it's round zero, they play Sydney. I'm pretty confident they do. Um, oh no, it's a GWS. But they do play Sydney in that first, uh, in those first five blocks. And then they also play Hawks. Those are two of his obviously notoriously worst teams to play against because uh, Sydney and Hawks both tag Dacos and they've been having effective tags on him. So he has the potential of that. Now, what we know about Dacos is he could shrug that off completely and he could go 130, like 100%. But playing a little bit of devil's advocate here, I think it's more likely than than likely that he drops maybe 50K in the first five, six weeks. And you got to also remember they also have a round zero. So so uh, Dacos's price will change in round two. So let's say he has a couple of poor games and starts to drop in price. He'll drop in price, you know, round two, round three, round four, and round five. So four potential price drops, obviously depending on what he's scoring like, um, before uh, his buy. So I've gone with a little bit of different tact. I think the one that I'm definitely starting at uh, D1 is James Sicily. Part of the reason, they have the round zero buy, which means that the only buy that they actually have is the last buy um, of the of the normal buy areas. So round 15. So he's probably the best premium, best high-end premium for that um, I th at this stage. Yeah, I was toying with, with even a, a Luke Ryan or something like that, but I just, I, look, he's burnt me after choosing him two years ago and then him coming out last year and going 110. I just, I don't know if I can do that. It's kind of, it, it stings. But Port and uh, Frio do have the best buy options because they're in the, a standalone buy on their own. And they also have the round zero. So therefore, they're the most... They cover you through the main buys and they don't have issues during the regular... Uh, the, the start of the season. So, um, thought about Luke Ryan, thought about Dan Houston. 
Ultimately, I think James Sicily is the one to go. And then those guys are guys you couldn't upgrade to. Um, always found, even though Sicily obviously can throw the odd 60 game here or there and drop in price, most of the time during the season, he's really hard to get. And I hate not having him and watching him go like 140, 150, 170. I think he went 174 or something last year. I, I can't stand it. So I'm not interested in doing that. Um, starting with James Sisley, I think is the right move this year. And I think the Hawks do get marginally better. How much better? I'm not sure. Does that increase his average? I don't know. What we know about his average last year was that that was his injury average from the year before, or injury free average, I should say. So he's had basically a two year average of 114. That's pretty good. And even at his price, I'm, I'm happy to lock that down with a great buy. Um, from here is where it starts to get a little bit Interesting. So part of the reason for this is buy strategy. Part of the reason for this is a role change. And that's, I've gone straight to Hayden Young here at D2 at the moment. Um, so 525K, he obviously yeah, increased his average up to 95 last year. It's sort of a mini breakout, I guess. Um, I think he was 90 or 89 or something like that, close to high 80s, early 90s the year before. So uh, yeah, a little bit on that. However, He's also now um, floating into midfield. And so it's already been talked about in preseason that he will be playing in midfield as opposed to playing behind the ball, which is his traditional role. Um, so there's a potential there that he's got a point, another points bump in him. How much that is, not sure at this stage. And the likelihood is he probably will play the defensive midfielder. He'll probably play defensive side of the ball, at least while he rotates through. Um how much it, you know, those are tr aren't traditionally amazing, you know, like premium super coach numbers is in like, you know, 110 plus. But I do think that he's probably got somewhere between anywhere between 100 to 108 average in him this year, um, which is value at his price. So I, I don't mind that. And of course, with that good buy, that gives a little, uh, ease a little bit of pressure on that back line. Um, I also think. Frio's matchups are, are, are pretty decent for the entire year. They've got a pretty easy draw. So I don't mind Hayden Young as a pick. I think of the, you know, say five to 550K guys, he's probably the pick of the bunch. You know, I looked at Jordan Ridley, not really interested in him. I've, I've been burned by him by the past. Seems to be the Mr. Fix-It anytime there's an injury or something. He's just the guy that gets, uh, from a super coach point of view, killed. Um the one that's a little bit outside of that, which I don't mind yet, but I, I just want to see how he acts under Uze is, is Jaden Short. So at went to 98 last year. Does he have another step? Is he now the go-to guy? Don't know. Don't really love Sheasel. A lot of talk with McKercher and Fisher playing behind the ball. Sheasel's going to see a lot more time in midfield and up forward. And that could obviously stint his growth in terms of a super coach average. Um... Outside of that, not really interested in Whitfield for many reasons. Uh, Redmond doesn't really do anything for me, especially with the news that Nick Martin might be going back there at stages during the season. Um, we've seen this from Bailey Dale. So there's really, like, outside of that, I get down to a guy that I like here as my third. And there's a strategy around this. And if you've watched um, uh, Swiss's podcast, he would have explained it uh, in, in that podcast. But Brayshaw here is, for me, basically a Dacos holder. So what I'm doing with Brayshaw, they have the round six buy. Collingwood has the round five buy. So the idea is carry Brayshaw through to round five and then trade him directly to Nick Dacos. Now, hopefully, there's a parity there where it's only a little bit of extra cash to go from Brayshaw to, um, to Dacos. It would be great if over those first five rounds, Brayshaw averaged the same as Dacos or matched him for average. Um, that would be a huge win because essentially I'd like to start with Dacos instead, but I just think that it's a, a, a fiscal benefit and also a points benefit to go this way. Um, so look, <coughs> Brayshaw, if he gets that mid roll, so we've got um, Jordan and Harms out of the rotation there. Uh, Clayton Oliver, obviously, we don't really know what's happening with him. I assume he will be suiting up round round zero, round one. Um, so I don't, I don't think that that is a consideration, but I do think that they will probably go in with their three midfielders as Brayshaw, um, the three main mids, I should say, as Brayshaw, Oliver, and Petraka. With obviously, you've got rotations from Rivers, who seems to be getting more and more time in that midfield moving forward. Um, and you'll get guys like Spargo, etc. cetera. Um, so, but yeah, Brayshaw as a midfielder just scores points, right? So 
I'm happy to run that train for five weeks, given his price and value that, that comes with that price, and then flip him. Now, part of this, though, is that I need to start with a little bit of money in the bank. So I actually do start with about 110 k in the bank with this team. Um, so for those playing at home, you can add that all up. I have considered going um, Himmelberg in this spot and freeing up a little bit more cash just because of his first couple of rounds. But you, then I have to trade him in round three, and it doesn't really work. If I was to do that, I'd have to trade him to, say, someone like Kitty Coleman, who may or may not be amazing at 400k, depending on what Kitty Coleman we get early in the season. Um, but yeah, there's definitely an option for that as well. Uh, so next here, we start to get into the rookie price players, of course. Um, I think everyone will start with him, but Zach Williams has to be in your team. Unfortunately, it, the price is just too good to pass up for a guy that can easily average 80 plus. Um, 216k, even as injury riddle as he is, I think he will be arguably probably the most owned player in Supercoach this year. Maybe only second to Harley Reid. So, uh, and that's saying something. Um, now, there are quite a lot of, there is quite a lot of value all across the park in defense. But for me right now, obviously, we don't know too much about rookie scoring. I think Josh Gibkes presents the easiest play on field. You know, we've seen him before um, average well enough for a rookie. I think rookie season, he was, you know, hitting 50s and 60s regularly. I think he spiked the occasional 80. Um they're going to need... He's obviously been out injured for a season and he's come back and his price has dropped dramatically. He's actually cheaper now than what he was, I think, in his rookie season. So um, something to be aware of there. Um, there are others you could put in this spot. I think Dan Curtin's also one that I, I'm monitoring at his price. Um, and there are quite a few others. Um, the, I've just gone with right now, obviously most of them are placeholders, but say Nick Caulfield, for example, if he gets a run there, again, a guy that we know can average about 80 or somewhere between 70 and 80, if he gets the right role. Um, and it's definitely yeah, a possibility there at the doggies. And then again, some more mature age guys. So again, we've seen Marty Hall, if he gets a role at, um, at Melbourne, he can, we know he can score points. The one that I think is pretty much a lock for everyone at this point is Toby Pink. Um, Rumored to be you know, leading the um, leading the race to secure a fullback position with the buckets Mackay out. Um, so I think that's between him and I think it's Nguyen, uh from the from the who was from the Tigers that's come across. But he is a forward. I think he's forward only at the moment. Um, so pink at the moment uh, fills out my D eight. So I've got the the structure here pretty much the three premiums. Do we call? Williams a mid price is probably rookie price to be fair, but it is definitely looking to be like a more of a guns and rookies season for sure. Now onto the midfield. So initially I was hard against um, starting with the highest price players, but there's so much value around that it's kind of hard to just not like, unless you really wanted to skimp and get like, say, 13, 14, like 13, like light, uh, like medium sized premiums or, or medium to high, and then, or 14 really light premiums. Like you could probably do that, but you'd have to avoid guys like Bont. Um, and so at this stage, I had the money to do it. I'm completely fine fading Bont, but the benefits to Bont are ob obviously the best buy again. So they have the last buy. So same buy as, say, Sicily here in the back end. So that's the best buy in terms of covering the other buys. Um, I mean, you don't have to worry about it for quite a, a substantial amount of time. Um, you have a perma captain every single week. So you'd never have to worry about either having a VC or C option because you always have the bond. Um, and I don't think, I can't see his role diminishing. I can only see it getting better. Um, I, I can't see him going forward because they have a plethora of forwards. Um, they just lost a mid. So realistically, he should, should still maintain or at least hit a 120 average. Um, and if you look at the mids from last year, that's a 10-point swing. He's 10, 10 point per game better than the next best player. It's hard to ignore that. So at this stage, he's in. Um, and then they go a bit lighter moving forward. So the next guy is, again... This is more buy consideration and output. So I'm going with Butters here at uh, M2. And Butters has been locked in my side pretty much since day one. And I can't get rid of him. I don't think I will. Um, having that great buy, 
Uh, he's obviously a, another year older in the system. Rosie, his best mate as captain. Uh, Port on should be on the up again. Um, and they will be on the back of Zach Butters. He also played every game last year. So, uh, yeah, Butters is now locked. And, and of course, the X fun factor. Like, I love watching Butters play, and I would hate... I absolutely... is again, one of those players. I hate not having him in your team and watching a Port game because I know how good he is. And every time he touches the ball, it's just magical. So, uh, yeah, needed in my life. Um, next one, another buy special um, slash obviously very solid player in Caleb Sarong. I personally believe he's the best of the Fremantle mids. Um, you know, when you talk about Brayshaw, you, Sarong, even Fife, Erasmus, Johnson, etc. I think he's the leader in that group. There's also talk that Brayshaw could be moved more outside, which might put a bit more reliance on Sarong. And what that does is it allows them to use, say, a Johnson as that defensive mid, and Sarong can just do what he does best. And instead of tagging like he has done in previous years, not so much last year, um, but he can just focus on finding the footy, and he's brilliant at doing that. So um, I like Sarong here and in this place um, at M3. Um, moving further down, we move on to... Uh, this is a bit of a by play. So... One of the one of the GWS mids is going to go huge. I'm banking it on Kelly. So in the first couple of rounds, so you got to think they play North and 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 West Coast in the first two rounds. The West Coast, I think, granted, is away and North at home, um, but they have arguably the best round one two fixtures back to back. So having this one uh, GWS player with a plan to flip in in gray in round three to a Carlton or, or Brisbane player who just come off their buy. So they wouldn't have changed in price. So the idea for me here, and again, this is preseason. Like I know, you know, don't plan to trade or, you know, um, et cetera. But I, I like the idea of him going 140, 140, and then bang, Sam Walsh has, got, has had a, a good couple of games. Over to Sam Walsh for a trade. You get the points that week. So you actually do gain on the, on the competition. Um, GWS also have the round 12 buy, which sucks, but Carlton have the round 14 buy. So you skip their initial buy and then you come into their round 14 buy, which is a lot better. Um, so Kelly, for me, that could be Tom Green. It could be Canelio. Um, but Green is near another 50K. So there's a value thing there. I mean, if, if Kelly, because also you got to remember the GWS play round zero, their price changes in round two. So you will actually, if they, if he has a good run, you'll get the initial price rise out of Josh Kelly. So it might be, say, a 30, 40K bump, right? I think Walsh is only like 7K more expensive or something like that. Like, it's a really good value selection. Um, but who knows what could happen at that point. But yeah, definitely targeting someone like a Sam Walsh there. Um, or it could be a Neil, could be a Dunkley, to be honest. It could be either of those guys. But I think, again, Brisbane have that first buy. So doesn't help in that. Or it's not the greatest in that sense, but it's all good. Um, now we start to get into some more value options. So I'm going with um, Matt Crouch as my M5. Um, now, I think he went 108 in the back end last year. He had that um, a sub game, I think sub or injury game early in the year, which has kept his average down, which has kept him affordable for this season. Um, so for 490k, a guy that can go 108, pretty valuable, really. Um, and... I anticipate him as a guy that basically is my M8 for the season. Um, is 108 enough to be an M8? Yeah, most seasons it is. Most seasons it's actually well in the realm. Um, if we have a look on mids last year, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So Luke Davies Uniac was. 10 at 113. However, there was no... So Dunkley was a forward. Take that out. Uh, yeah. So technically it would be... Goulden. Goulden would be your 10th at 111. So pretty close. It's not like, you know, smack bang on top top uh, 10 territory. We're talking about, you know, three points and five spots between him and, say, a Chera at that, at that spot. Um, uh, speaking of Goulden, I do love Goulden as a pick. I just... Not sure about how much upside is there at 111 at 622. Might be someone I upgrade to rather than start with. We'll see how we go. Um, and also they ha they do have the two buys in the early rounds. 
Um, okay, so from also again, Adelaide has the last buy, um, so that's good, and so does Carl Amon. So this is a a bit of a niche pick, I guess. Um, 483k comes in at at M6. Now the reason I'm doing this, I, I talked to a, quite a few people who are really hot on him, and there is definitely reasons for. And there's some reasons against, but I'll go through it. But basically, Carl Ammon, Ammon, Amon, I'm not sure how you pronounce his surname. I do apologize. Um, he moved to a distributor role off halfback um, through six games at the end of last year. He had some kickouts. Um, interestingly enough, didn't seem to uh, impede Sicily scoring at all. He still went off and tonned. I think his biggest score of the year was, was when Ammon was back there as well. Um, and during that time, I think... His highest score was 133, and he averaged 106 over those six games. Now, if you do extrapolate that over a season, that puts him as actually a top six to eight defender on last year's numbers. So the the premise here would be we start him at M6 if he got the role. Now, if he's not playing as a, as a distributor of halfback in the preseason, then wipe it wipe it clean. But they the Hawks did mention in their um, review of the year that they did experiment with that towards the back end and they had a lot of success and they looked forward for him training with the defenders this year. So whether or not they continue with that, they do have a hundred halfbacks. They've got Seamus Mitchell. They've got Josh Weddle obviously coming through as well. Um, and obviously their existing lineup. So whether or not that holds is another question. But the plan would be start Ahmed at M6. By round six, when he gets DPP, you move him back into defense and you open up the midfield to another mid spot and mid upgrade further down the line. That is the plan there. Um, so, yeah, we'll see how that works out. At the moment, there's price, there's, there's room in my team for that kind of player. Um, now, moving on to the rooks. Um, so, just getting into, I think McKercher, obviously, if he's got a half back role, is going to score quite well. Um, and of course, uh, everyone pretty much has these two. Look, Riley Sanders as well. Again, expensive rooks, but the, the point of this is we don't really know at the moment. The best information we have is that these guys are going to have early impact and they're going to be good scorers. So I've put them there. Worst case scenario, I can always downgrade them if I need to. Um, and then bench-wise, I think Jai Clark, obviously, I think he broke. He had one game and broke his nose as a sub or something on 13. So he's come down in price, which is quite nice. Um, I think he absolutely gets games this year. Whether or not it's round one is another question, but I think he definitely does. Um, I think a no-brainer pick is Jeremy Sharp. Um, one that I missed in the defender section was Chapman. So Chapman and Sharp apparently are competing for a wing spot at the moment. Um, whether or not they both get it, I don't think so. But uh, I think you know Sharp is as, as good a chance of any to, to, as for a rookie at 123K to make a real impact. My only concern would be if he becomes the 23rd player um, and obviously he's the sub. That sucks. Um, now, in terms of the last spot, I've looked, this could be anyone here. I've gone with um, Harry Dimitia. Definitely doesn't start round one, in my opinion, unless there's a few injuries. Um, but he's got a super coach pedigree. So if he does get uh, the right role and some some game time, I think he could go really well. This is more of a placeholder. I can literally go anyone here, but um, we'll just see how we go for now. Rux, I just, I'm not even going to dilly-daddle around this. I will talk a little bit about it, but it's Gorn and Grundy. I, I don't think there's been a year where we've had this much value in the Rux, but even the premium value is good enough. It's, it's so good. There's no real point, in my opinion, in trying to d play games with it. So I've you know there's guys going with English great for 715k for 135k less I can get Gorn who might average very similar and who has averaged higher in the past. Yes, Gorn is uh, a little bit older and I get that. But we saw once um, Grundy was out of the team at the end of last year, Gorn spikes went th Gorn scores went through the roof. He's now Sol Rock again. He should average in my opinion somewhere around 120. Now, is that enough to justify him over English at for 150K? Can I find eight points a game? I think absolutely I can. That's not to say that I won't look to try and get um, English in at some point, but that is to say that um, I think that the value proposition is better than chasing a premium player in this position. Um, Grundy again, so the, the three-game sample size, it was only three-game sample size, but of him being a solo ruck when Gorm was... 
out injured, I want to say. Um, he averaged 138 over those three games. Now, granted, he didn't have the best opposition of rucks in that time, but we know what Grundy can do. So Grundy, to me, can be a 115 averaging ruck, which means that he'll make you 120 grand anyway. And again, you can, if you want to transition him out or use him as a stepping stone, sure, at, at some point, I, I think you can do that. I, to me, these are season guys. I think that you, you pick him at that price and you, you make up your points elsewhere. That's my opinion. Um, now, guys that I've I've obviously flirted with are guys like Cherry, but who can probably go, say, 90, 95, so you will make some money out of that. Um, there's some great rookies, so you could look at getting, say, a Jordan Sweet, um, depending on what happens there, over there at Port uh, with their ruck line. You know, if he becomes a primary ruck, you probably want to start Jordan Sweet at R3 um, and then make the cash and then transition out. And then you've got cover as well early. I see that as a as a win win where you know down you don't even have to have a downgrade later. You can literally run say a Jordan Sweet there at R three, and then uh, de- you know just put him to say Finbar Mali, which is the one hundred two k ruck forward from North. Um, so yeah, that, that's who I've got there at the moment. But yeah, I could see the I see the opportunity to go with. Um, uh, with Jordan Sweet, and I can also see the opportunity to look at, I think it is Sam Naismith as well. Um, so depending on what they do at, at the Tigers, will he be able to be a ruck, or will they use Samson Ryan in that uh, so forward ruck role, or is he back up? Um, you know, a few options there with Sam Naismith, but one to keep an eye on as well. All right, the forwards get a bit dicey. Um, but I honestly think that the forward line is probably the worst forward line we've had in a long time. I'm literally locking in Jack McRae, not because I think he's a great selection, but because I think that um, he's the safest out of all the other picks in terms of ability to say, I'm going to be a guaranteed top six. He's probably the only one. Outside of that, I could question mark every other forward. Um, so I've locked him in, and then I've literally gone cheap pretty much from then on in. At this stage, I'm locking in Zach Fisher. I don't... I, th- I wish he was 50k cheaper, but 378k for a guy who's a bit of, been a bit of a journeyman over the time, but has had a role change. He's moved back behind the ball and looked very good last year at Carlton. And now they're using him as a distributor off half back. Now with moving Sheasel obviously up the ground and Zach Jack Siebel retiring, Aaron Hall gone, there is a, there's points to be had in that North back line. He's going to get some. Um, how much? And if that's if he's a best 22 player, only preseason is going to tell us that. So he's definitely a watch. But for now, I've got him in that spot. Um, other guys I like, uh, yeah, guys like Flanders, but we don't really know what the mids are going to be like at the Gold Coast um, with Dimmer being there and what their rotation lineup is. So I'm again, another watch there. I don't hate Luke Jackson, especially with the news that um, Sean Darcy is actually still not back in training yet because he's recovering from injury again. Um, but Jackson's really only an option if Darcy is injured or he's got some primary games. When he does that, he's absolutely an option. So those are those are considerations there. Okay. Um, I'm going to run through these guys, but I will go through. I think James Harms is the next best option, guys. Um, I think that he secures up a role in that best 22, plays a rotation player on the wing and half forward flank and gets a bit of midfield time as well. Um, I think that he's definitely got the ability to average, say, 75 to 85 and make us some decent money in that forward line. The one I don't really like is James Jordan. Um, I can't really see it. Um, I don't think he's going to get inside time. I think his outside time is going to be limited. And if he is on the outside, I probably think he's more... Um, if they've got Goulden on a wing and they're using him primarily, he's going to be that defensive side winger, which doesn't score well anyway. Um, so Jordan's the one that I'm kind of fading at the moment, but preseason again will determine a lot of it. Um, I'd like Billings. I think the Billings can average somewhere between 70 to 80 quite easily, maybe even higher, um, depending on the role that he gets. And um, I think that there's the opportunity for him to jump on a wing there and rotate theory there with um, Langdon and... Uh, Hunter. Um, so usually they have you know, guys that can rotate through half forward flank and wing. And I think that Billings fits that role perfectly there. And they're a better team. Melbourne are a better team than Saints. He should have more opportunity there. 
Um, so if he's um, if he's fit, he's firing. I think he can score really well. And again, preseason watch, but I don't mind that at all. Um, Harley Reid, obviously, I think everyone will have him. And then the last one here I've got is Finn McRae. So the younger brother of Jack McRae, finally getting his opportunity there at the Pies. I think he starts round one on field. Um, again, another preseason watch, but I'm definitely of the opinion that um, with what they've got out, they've basically had to promise him mid-time to sort of extend his contract. Only signed a one-year deal. He will be playing this year, and hopefully it's in midfield as opposed to, say, a forward role. Um, outside of that, you could go a few guys here. I've gone with Sam Darcy. Um, the other one that I don't mind early for, for early scores is Cadman with that uh, North and uh, West Coast matchup. Um, but could go any of those. And I also, I think it's uh, Sean M- Manor. I want to say Manor. Um, so he was obviously, the, I think he was the leading goal kicker last year in the VFL. Um, came across to, he's sort of a, you know, a forward mid type. Um, I think he probably starts round one and we'll go from there. So there you have it, guys. That is my team in a nutshell. Um, as I said, worked out to yeah, 111,600 left over. Um, I think this works out at 12 premiums, if I'm not mistaken. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 premiums, Fisher, the expensive Rooks, of course, um, and uh, Zach Williams as well. Uh, and 110k in the bank to get Dacos in round six. So there you have it, guys. Let me know what you think in the in the comment section. Um, let me know if you've got any questions about your your team at the moment, and we'll go from there. Other than that, we will see you soon, and I can't wait to hear from you.